Hello and welcome to our talk. Um, this work is at the boundary between differentiation and parallelization. Um, the general context is uh, uh, we take a parallel program in a shared memory uh, style and we transform it by reverse mode automatic differentiation into another program and the question is can the differentiated program inherit the parallel properties of the original PyMol code. Uh, so before we go into the parallel details uh, we uh, just recall a few properties and definitions about reverse mode automatic differentiation. Um, so in general AD transforms a program that computes a function f into a program P prime that computes some derivatives of X. Uh, in particular, reverse mode AD builds a program that will write P bar that uh, computes the derivative of F, F prime, but multiplied on the left uh, by a vector which is uh, a weighting of the various outputs of F. Mm, just about the jargon that I will uh, use a few times later, uh, I often call the uh, differentiated code P bar adjoint code and the corresponding differentiated variables X bar and Y bar uh, the adjoint variables. So um, reverse AD as it uh, names shows uh, propagates and computes and propagates the derivatives backwards compared to the original execution order of the original program. Um, the, the strong point of reverse AD is that uh, the cost of computing this X bar uh, derivative does not depend on the number of inputs, that is the size of X. And that's simply great for gradients, because for gradients, uh, Y itself is a scalar. There is one output of interest that you call the cost function, and you compute the gradient of the function uh, that computes this cost with respect to its inputs x. So this will compute x bar, the gradient of the cost function, in a single run of the program p bar, which is just great for gradients. Uh, of course, it, there's no free lunch, as people say, so there's a cost to that. Um, First, that this reverse differentiation reverses the order of the control flow of the original program. So, so the result is a program which is not very intuitive uh, from the reads of it. The other thing is it needs to store the intermediate values or some of the intermediate values of the original computation into, let's say, a stack to reuse it in the reverse order during the computation of the derivatives. And this implies a high need of storage space. Anyway, this is uh, a few uh, examples of what uh, reverse AD code will look like. So it's all based on the uh, small math which is here, but which is probably best explained on an example. Suppose there is an instruction such as y receives sinus of x, and this will build, uh, by reverse differentiation, a set of two instructions that have this strange shape. So one thing to notice first is, as the original instruction read x to overwrite y, the derivative instruction reads y bar to overwrite x bar. So it goes in the reverse direction. The other thing to notice is that x was read and x bar, as a result, is incremented by a value. There is a special case which is interesting, which is the case where y is not overwritten but incremented by the original instruction and as a consequence y bar in the differentiated code is simply read and not reset to zero as on the line above. So there is a duality that needs to be uh, underlined. The reads of the original code become increments in the differentiated code and vice versa the increments in the original code become plain reads in the differentiated code. Okay, to be complete, 
uh, and to stress again this notion of reverse differentiation, uh, this example is about a loop and you see the reverse differentiated code corresponding to the loop. It iterates in the reverse direction from n to 1 and if you look at the second instruction of the original loop, it gives birth to the first instruction here of the differentiated loop, whereas the first instruction of the original program becomes the last pair of instructions of the differentiated program. So everything goes in reverse. Okay, now let's uh, focus on the parallel properties. Like we saw, a read of a variable gives an increment of the adjoint variable. An increment of a variable gives a read of the adjoint variable. And the good thing is that um, just as there is no conflict between reads in a shared memory program, there is no conflict between increments provided they are atomic. So this uh, implies a few good news. First is that the data dependence graph on the derivative variables have exactly the same shape as the data dependence graph of the primal program on the primal variables. Only as the direction of the arrows is reversed, but loops and all these have the same shape. As a consequence, the reverse AD of a parallel region is a parallel region. Good. And also that uh, when it comes down to all sorts of privatized variables, they can be handled nicely. For example, uh, a first private primal variable will give birth to a plus reduction adjoint variable and vice versa. And finally, the derivative of a shared variable will be a shared variable. Um, well, except that all this is true provided increments can be atomic. So that's the bad news. Because atomics are costly. And how can we compensate that? Well, we could turn them into reductions. And we tried that. It's better, but it's still costly. So it would be much better to get rid of atomic pragmas when it's possible, so in the cases where it's possible. So to discover each and every possible case where an atomic pragma is not needed. And this can be discovered by paralyzing compilers, for example, on polyhedral uh, methods. But there, is, there are limitations to that, and we can complement these methods by something new due to the fact that we are actually running differentiation. So we have an original program, which we call the primal code, and we know, or let us assume, at least, that the primal code is correct. And this is a knowledge we're going to use to discover that some atomics are not needed in the differentiated code. So let's do that on this example. So we assume the primal code is correct. This is a loop from the primal code. Uh, it's a very simple one, of course. And since it is correct, we know that uh, this right of R cannot conflict with this other right of R on two different uh, iterations. In other words, for any pair i and i prime of indices in the loop range, different, uh, i different from i prime, we know that of i, this index expression, is always different from of of i prime. And similarly, of of i is also always different from i prime itself because of possible conflicts between this guy and that guy. So let's accumulate all this knowledge that we can find from the primal code. And to do that, we sweep through 
all parallel loops and for each parallel loop with an index that we will call i uh, we fill the model with all the knowledge we can find first piece of knowledge is that two different indices will never go uh, or let's say two different threads will never access the same index so i is different from i prime and then for each pair of accesses to a given array A in the parallel loop, one with index expression 1 and one with index expression 2, and one of them being a right, then we know that since there is no conflict, exp1 is different from expression 2 prime, which is expression 2 in which we have replaced i by i prime, and similarly, expression 2 is different from expression 1 prime. And we accumulate all this into the model. Next, we look at the differentiated loop now. The reverse differentiated loop, which has this shape. Bear with me, because it's not very intuitive. But we see here that we have right accesses to u-bar here and there and they might be in conflict. So, we need to ask a few questions about these conflicts. Could we prove that for two different indices, i and i prime, uh, of i plus 7 is equal or different from of i prime plus 7? And we also need to look for the case where these two guys might be in conflict, which uh, boils down to this question, and there are others, uh, I, well, in, in fact, there is only one left, which is i plus 7. Could it be equal to i prime plus 7? So these are the questions we need to ask. And how do we ask them? Well, we ask each question separately by adding it into the accumulated knowledge which is in the knowledge base of a theorem prover. So this here, can I highlight this? Well, more or less, yes. This is the original knowledge that we have extracted from the uh, primal code. And if we add to it the assertion that two indices here are equal, which would mean that there is a conflict, um, well, we ask the theorem prover whether this new model is satisfiable or not. And if we are lucky and this model is not satisfiable, this proves that the conflict does not occur. And if for any question concerning U-bar we can show that there is no conflict, then all the accesses to U-bar do not need to be atomic. Um, we implemented that. Um, we implemented that using two tools. One is the AD tool Taponade, in which we have uh, added uh, the bits about knowledge and questions extracted from the original code on one hand and from the differentiated code on the other hand. And of course, the AD tool takes care of the generation of the differentiated code. Mm, and there is an interface by which the mm, differentiation tool uh, fills the knowledge base into Z3, uh, the theorem prover, and by which Tabernet asks the questions to Z3. And of course, uh, Depending on the result of these questions, the differentiated code will be different. We also exploit uh, the possibilities from the data flow analysis that are present in Tapenet to uh, reduce the number of questions uh, using uh, information about activity analysis, things that can prove that some variables are uh, definitely not active at some point, so they don't need uh, we don't need to compute their derivatives and therefore there is even fewer risk of conflict there. So this is just one example taken from uh, the examples that are uh, given in the paper. 
It's one which I find quite representative. Uh, it's uh, GFMC, so it means Greens function. Monte Carlo, it comes from benchmark suite that's called Coral. Um, here on this picture, we have the timings, timings of the primal code here on the left, and the timings of the differentiated code on the three sets of bars on the right. Um, these three differentiated codes differing only by the method which is used to deal with um, uh, shared variables in the adjoint. Uh, here is uh, our method, the one that, oh, this doesn't work, um, <clears throat> the one that uses the theorem prover to prove uh, uh, that some atomics are not needed. This is the one that adds systematically atomics because there was no way to prove that they are not needed, and this is the method that replaces the atomic uh, shared variables with uh, reduction variables. Okay, so um, as you can see, the primal code behaves very well in parallel because the parallel execution here in red uh, with, the, with some number of threads, with the most appropriate number of threads, uh, runs much faster. Here we can see on the opposite, that the atomic, the code that places atomic on each uh, increment of adjoint variables costs a lot. And uh, atomic pragmas, of course, make the program correct, but at a huge cost. This is so huge here that any parallel execution with any number of threads uh, takes much longer than the uh, serial execution of the same differentiated code. Whereas for reduction method, it's not as bad. But of course it's not very impressive because there is a cost associated to the final reductions and also the, it's not um, here visible on the runtime question, but it of course increases the memory uh, footprint of the program. And for AD here gives us a differentiated code in which, for this particular example, most of the atomic pragmas could be removed so that the, diff the, the, the parallel execution of the differentiated uh, code is much better. So this is also visible here on the speedup uh, chart, where the, the one about form AD here on the top behaves very well. Uh, whereas the two others for reduction is already not so good and the one for uh, atomics everywhere uh, is catastrophic. Mm. Well, there are a few other examples on the paper and now I just need to wrap up. Uh, what we did is we plugged uh, a theorem prover which is Z3 into an AD tool to, to prove that uh, some or hopefully all conflicts in a reverse AD code uh, do not effectively uh, happen, in which case we can uh, avoid placing uh, atomic pragmas in the code. And uh, the proof is based on the information that we gather from the primal code because we assume that the primal code itself is correct. So this sort of information is, is essentially out of reach for parallelizing compilers because they are not built to extract information from uh, other codes. So here we uh, take advantage of the comparison between the primal and the differentiated code. And this has been so far applied to OpenMP Fortran code and uh, we believe it's uh, almost readily extensible to other thread parallel settings, uh, but this is obviously future work. And with that, uh, we thank you for your attention and we will welcome questions.